thank you and uh, so <coughs> great to be here. So this is really about, we call it the race to the top, scaling climate solutions globally, which we really see as, as the holy grail. And um, I hope it creates a lot of strong interest. Okay, just a few words about the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. We bring together the leading transformers and disruptors taking action to halve emissions by 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions. And here are some examples of the companies which is part of our, our network. But we also work really closely with science. We are a science aligned initiative. We are an action initiative. Uh, and one example is Oxford Net Zero where we have kicked off this work together on the climate solutions framework. And we'll come back on that in a minute. Let's see if I can get, okay. So let's kick off and really try to address the first question is why, why do we really need a climate solutions framework? Over to you, Kaya. Thanks so much. Um, I give a lot of lectures and I prefer to stand, so I'm just going to stand so you can see. Um, also, thank you so much to the panel for coming. When I saw who was on this panel, I was like, wow, that's incredible. Um, so, what percentage of companies meet the minimum net zero criteria? My job as an academic is to track our progress and my team specializes in the progress of non-state actors globally towards the net zero challenge. This is an example of our tracker, zerotracker.net. Um, we look at just kind of the high level criteria and we find that less than one third of the Forbes 2000 list is meeting the, uh, the criteria, the minimum criteria that you would see for the Race to Zero campaign, the global net zero campaign backed by the UN, with only 5% committed to aligning their capital expenditure according to the Climate Action 100 plus framework. So I'm not interested in a place called Solutions House in pointing fingers at others. I'm part of the standards and policy community. So I had to ask myself, what have we done wrong to not incentivize companies to align their spending, their innovation, and their brilliant talent to the net zero challenge? And one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about for years on uh, the research group that I'm a part of is given the wicked problem that is climate change, what are the interventions that are truly sensitive uh, that we can make that can accelerate the speed and scale that we need to meet this challenge? And so we've created two typologies of what we call these sensitive intervention points. This comes from a long tradition in systems thinking. Um, and the two typologies we look at are, for example, a kick, something that is almost at a threshold and it just needs a little kick to kind of go off the cliff and then really move. So that could be renewable energy is meeting thresholds where it just becomes completely uncompetitive to have a coal facility, for example. And then one company makes a significant investment in the right place and the whole region is kind of becomes renewable. We can't go back from that stage. And then there's also things that are more like a shift. So to use the energy example, uh, this could be like a breakthrough in battery technology, right? And that breakthrough leads us to be able to scale system change throughout the whole energy system globally. Um, these are the kinds of things that we think are important and that the science says we need to be focusing on. And yet in the standards landscape, we focus on inventories and we don't have any place for companies to talk about their work on things like this. We have totally taken away any kind of reward system for one of the most powerful forms of intervention that we have at our disposal. And that seems fundamentally out of line with the science. I'm here to say that companies globally are out of line with the science in terms of 1.5, but I'm here to say also that we as a standards and policy community are out of line with the science in terms of how we incentivize change. So I'm really a huge fan of this kind of ambition loop thinking. Um, I used to be a climate activist. I used to sort of put myself in front of pipelines. I used to be the kind of person stickering outside of companies. Um, I'm still that person, right? Because like we all deep down are just fundamentally so uncomfortable with what's happening that that's how we feel and that's how we want to act. 
But I also have been watching as a social scientist how change is happening in our system for a long time. And what ultimately we have is an opportunity to move the arrows in the right direction through a cycle of ambition from leaders, from business leaders, mostly the people in this room, uh, and governments, right? But we also know it's very easy for those arrows to tip in the opposite direction, especially if we start to make some progress and people feel threatened. So I've been thinking, you know, what is the kind of missing pillar of the ambition action loop? This, um, this slide originally was created by WRI years ago, and it really embodies what kind of the voluntary initiative approach we've taken in the global uh, transnational climate initiative is. But I think we've really missed out on the climate solutions piece that can keep the arrows going in the right direction. A systemic report that is out of date, so these numbers could actually be more optimistic at this stage, is that low carbon solutions could be competitive in 75% of sectors by 2030 compared to uh, zero in 2015. And that low carbon growth this decade will generate over 35 million jobs. Uh, research out of my own institution shows that um, early action on energy, for example, on the energy transition could save us $12 trillion globally. These are the kinds of things that we need to be talking about more, and we need to give companies a way to talk about them that is not just in their inventories, but also more qualitatively. I'm a qualitative researcher, but we've been obsessed with the kind of quantitative emissions reductions, and then failing to hit them year on year is frankly depressing us all. <laughs> so. We need to know what's at a minimum required by companies. We can't abandon the inventory, right? <laughs> we can't fix what we can't measure. We all know that we need to improve data transparency, but we also know that the solution can't be held or fixed if it's siloed in the accounting firm of a, a small piece of a company, right? We all know that it needs to be embedded in business strategy. I've sent, sat through so many brilliant panels this week that talk about how it needs to be integrated in every part of a company. That's a huge part of the 1.5 playbook. So at a minimum, companies need to do a few things before they kind of claim that they might be leaders in climate solutions, otherwise it's just greenwashing. And we, we've set that out here before we like offer a new framework because we don't want to be accused of greenwashing ourselves. You need to set science aligned targets and KPIs to scale climate solutions. You need to have the right rules. You need to integrate your transition plan throughout the company. You need strategies to transform. But then what if we were to give companies a word to talk about what it is that is going to fix the problem? We actually have not, despite talking about climate solutions constantly, anecdotally, ever defined what it is. And if you don't define something, you don't give it the power and you don't put it into standards, you don't write laws or policies to incentivize it, and you don't write investment plans to incentivize it. So how can we define climate solutions? This is something that we're thinking about and we want your help with. First, a climate solution has to be something that can significantly lower carbon footprint. In line with the carbon law, this could be at least 50% lower, but preferably like 90% than business as usual. Then, of course, you need to define business as usual. That's where a lot of the debate's gonna come in. We don't even have a database, as far as I know, of what business as usual looks like that could be independent and measured against what we could be doing. That's a problem. Second, uh, the sole purpose of the solution needs to be enabling others to avoid or reduce emissions. And three, it has to fulfill the threshold set out in a robust taxonomy. Everyone's favorite word. Then, once we have a taxonomy of climate solutions, we can start defining climate solutions companies. Who here would like to be a net zero company? Okay, probably everybody. Mm. But actually, we find that 50% of the Forbes 2000 list hasn't even set a net zero or like target, and that's not even getting into the SME realm. It's seemingly not as attractive as it should be to be a net zero company. And while I, as the net zero policy lead at Oxford, want all companies to set a net zero target, and by the way, I want that to be mandatory, come to my regulation panel after this, I still think that there's something more optimistic we could call companies that could get their employees excited, that could get their CEOs excited, and frankly, that could be much more attracted to emerging markets that are not interested say Africa represents 4% of emissions globally, they're not interested in getting a slap on the wrist for their inventories. They're not interested in net zero as a frame. We have a climate justice fellow who's looking into this. It's not motivating for them. But if they feel that they can be part of the solution and profit from it, they could be a climate solutions company, that could be motivating. So how do we define a climate solutions company? 
First, we want to make sure that the products and services that quals qualify as the climate solutions could make up at least 90% of sales. That's what we're proposing. <coughs> Again, this is a very new idea and we'd love your input. Second, the company should have integrated climate and nature into its purpose, and I might add into uh, its articles of association. Mm -hmm. And that zero and interim targets and action plans should be in line with science to reduce emissions and nature impact throughout the value chain. So this is our proposal. It's really fresh, uh, and Johan is gonna talk a little bit more about it in detail. Warning, this is a technical <laughs> session, so I hope you signed up for that. <laughs> Thank you, Kaya. And actually, we have already, the last two years, we have applied, started to apply these principles with some companies as part of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative to do some initial road testing. So we don't start from, from scratch, but now we'd like to take it to the, to the next step and to review it and to get the input. Okay, so going back to the why question, we know that we need to have emissions basically by 2030 and every decade while protecting nature and and uh, scaling carbon sinks as well. We are not on track, we all know that, of course. We haven't still bent the curve, <coughs> which, is, which is very dangerous for humanity. We should be 100% aware of that. We need to do our utmost to bend the curve. But, but I would state that it's impossible to cut the emissions unless we focus on scaling up the climate solutions to shift out the fossil <coughs> economy, because it's very difficult. Unless we have an alternative, <coughs> we can't really motivate to cut the economy. So we really depend on how fast we can scale climate solutions, which could be like renewable energy, energy efficiency, electrical vehicles, you know, shared vehicles, re regenerative agriculture, natural forest. You all know the list of the solutions that we need to scale up. And the key challenge we have now is that the scaling is too slow. I would say we basically have two sets of solutions which has passed the sort of tipping point where you achieve self-sustaining feedback loops, and that would be renewable energy and uh, electrical vehicles. But we have a number of solutions we have to take over the tipping point. And as you know, with exponential scaling, we often perceive that things are going very slow in the beginning, <coughs> and it reaches a certain point where it's going fast. So this part is really super critical. We need to get more companies we need to invest in the scaling. So that's why climate, climate solutions is so incredibly essential. And I think it's also companies or states are not really motivated by the down curves. It's very difficult to motivate the company with the down curves. The key point is the up curves and setting the key performance indicator for how you actually grow things. Yeah, so that's... <coughs> Okay, and this is something we integrated, of course, in the playbook. You know, we launched that today, uh, the 2023 version, but it's been developed over now three and a half years with around 50 to 100 experts and continuously updated with the new standards. And as you can see, the framework we apply with the four pillars is about your own emissions, that's scope one and two, your value chain emissions, provide and scale solutions and contribute uh, to climate action in society with on, uh, with, uh, beyond your value chain. And as a company, to have a 1.5 line strategy, you should basically address all these uh, four pillars. So that's what we build into our <coughs> climate performance review when we assess companies and uh, encourage a race to the top and an opportunity to benchmark companies. Now, what we're focusing on today is the third pillar, which I would say is the holy grail for for many companies. Okay, the landscape, I just took some examples in terms of terms. And I said, a dear what we say in Sweden is, I try to translate, a dear child has many names. Love Can't that. be translated, I guess. But it means that there are a lot of different terms for this, like climate solutions, climate nature solutions, impact solutions, green solutions, low carbon solutions, avoided emissions, handprint, scope four. Okay, not exactly the same, but this is basically the landscape we are in. There are a number of frameworks and standards, and these are just a few, like the Taxonomy, Mission Innovation Net Zero Compatible Innovations Initiative, that's a long name, World Business Council's Guidance on Avoided Emissions, we've been part of that as well. The ITU L 1480 standards, it's just for the ICT sector, climate bonds, taxonomy, etc., and a lot of proprietary frameworks as well, which impact investors are using, so it's 
pretty fragmented landscape. Okay, um, what we will, this is a way to describe how we can segment climate solutions. Um, whatever, we select, uh, we decided to call it climate solutions today. <laughs> could, could use other terms. Okay, so it's of course, who is the actor? It's company, city, country, individual. Today we're focusing on companies. And in terms of companies, we need some different um, tools and frameworks dependent on companies. And this is a type of segmentation that we are testing. Product services that we will talk about today. Professional services, there is, there is uh, initiative driven by Oxford Net Zero on defining um, basically uh, methodology for professional services like advertising, consultancy services, so that's ongoing. Enabling platform could be digital platforms, which is basically supporting climate action and financial services. We're focusing on the first part today. And in terms of companies, we can at least split them in two different categories. The ones uh, who are transformative, they're starting with an existing service, an uh, existing business operation, which is basically not aligned with 1.5 and are driving a transformation towards becoming a climate solutions company. So that's, that's the first set of companies. The other one is the one basically started as, starting as a climate solutions company. So we have one example today, H2 Green Steel, for example. We come back to that. Okay, so this is, this is one way to visualize it, basically relating to the carbon law. Let's assume uh, that we're following a certain trajectory over time to reduce emissions. And according to our qualification, we should at least be 50% under the line, but preferably further down. So there is a possibility also to qualify the solutions dependent on, well, if you're already immediately cutting 95% or if you're cutting 50%. And just to give you two examples, maybe an electrical vehicle today uh, could qualify because the business as usual, it would cut 50%, but it won't do that in a couple of years. It needs to be produced by fossil free material to be able to qualify because the business as usual will uh, move down over time. And uh, I also pointed down near zero steel, which is maybe within five years on minus 95%. These are a couple of examples. We love to get feedback on this, of course. Okay. I think we, re we already covered this, Kaya, I think, in terms of the criteria. So I think I skipped that part. KPIs, everybody likes KPIs. <laughs> Exactly, so what we, what we started to do also in the new version of the playbook in dialogue with a number of companies and organizations is actually to start to define uh, what we call forward-looking KPIs uh, for companies, like best practice, across these uh, four pillars. And um, it's too difficult to read here, but you can take a business playbook. But three examples of KPIs which could be relevant for climate solutions could be uh, climate solutions revenue as percentage of total revenue. Climate solutions uh, capex and research and development. Spending as percentage of total capex. And the third one, which is related to avoided emissions, ton uh, CO2 equiv equivalents avoided over product life cycle. That's probably the most difficult one and a lot of discussion on how you actually should apply that practically. But we think the two first are very indicative and can be used quite immediately based on that you have definition. Yes. Thank you, so I think that actually ends our introduction into uh, the climate, the idea on the climate solutions uh, framework. And do you like to add anything from your perspective? Yeah, I'll just say that anytime you're always nervous proposing a framework, right? And it really is the rubber that hits the road in the, in the company examples that we care about the most. 
Um, so we're really pleased to hear from our panel about how they are either driving climate solutions in their company or developing a whole new business model, as I know is the case. Um, I'm going to have to run off to that panel on regulation, as I mentioned. So thank you so much, and I look forward to following up with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Kaya. So let's, let's move to the panel, which I think is the most interesting part. So okay, I start with you, Lars. Start with you, Lars. Can you tell me a little bit about your company and operation, and also how you how you are driving climate solutions? And do you relate to, to this type of definition as well? How you would do that? Yeah, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm Lars Lundström, and uh, head of product sustainability at a company called H2 Green Steel, based out of uh, of Sweden in Europe. Uh, and we are actually uh, joining the Exponential Roadmap Initiative today. We, we actually communicated that today, so it's, it's an extra pride for me to be here today. And also good to be back at Solutions House. H2 Green Steel then is building a company from the start. We are a, a startup. Uh, we are into our third year. I've been around for two and a half almost. Um, and what we're doing is we're building up a mill for creating green steel in, in northern Sweden. And green steel is actually um, steel where, which can abate, and we have business as usual in the steel industry. Mm, yes. So we can abate 95% of the CO2 emissions from the start uh, because we will emit like 135, 150 kilos per ton of produced steel uh, compared to a little bit more than two tons per ton in traditional steel making blast furnace. And what we will do is very, very shortly about technology is we will use hydrogen and we will use that to uh, reduce our, our iron into direct iron. And then we will use electric arc furnaces instead of using coke along this process. So in, in uh, <clears throat> three years, we will start our production. Right now, it's groundworks. And the trick that we are actually using uh, is design the product first. So we design what is green steel with this abatement, mainly flat steel with a very, very low footprint. Then we went to our customers, which are actually uh, mainly the great automotives of Europe who want to follow and meet their science-based target initiatives. Uh, and thereby they need, once they have electrified their driveline, they need to uh, push down their product footprint, i.e. their upstream scope three. Mm. And then we uh, implement and then we start to produce. So it's very, very flipped. Uh, <clears throat> our idea now is that we have a low intensity, 95% abatement. We will, of course, continue towards our net zero, which will be at the latest 2040. But the most important thing is that we scale our business. So now back to your true question. I just want to set it into perspective. Uh, and scaling is for us, first, we need to make our blueprint. We need to make the learnings. We need to make the mistakes. We need to make sure that we prove our case to customers, to investors, to banks, to policymakers, to the local community, etc. But we cannot wait for three years. No one can wait for three years. So we have actually started now looking into other markets also where we can find the similar conditions. I can come back to that if we want to have more detail later. So now we're looking at, at opportunities in North America, in South America, and also in Southern Europe to be able to scale this up and do it as quickly as possible. Because as important as it is to become better on our own operations, it's also even more important that we scale it. That's our true belief. Now I yeah. speak a lot, so I need to... Uh, Hand it over to you for that. And we, so we, we qualified you as a climate solutions company according to these uh, principles. Yeah. Uh, so over to you, Varun. Uh, Örstedt, you made a really uh, fantastic transformation as a company, which is really, truly impressive. So can you talk a little bit about Örstedt in general and also your sort of transformation to climate solutions? Totally. Um, well, thanks for having me. And I was really pleasantly surprised. Uh, I saw this new framework. Nobody ran this by me. And I said, huh, three steps, one, two, three. And I'm, I'm delighted to see that we actually qualify. Um, mm -hmm. We, Orsted, 
uh, are a clean energy company, uh, the world's largest pure play renewable energy company, and we produce renewable energy largely from offshore wind, but also from onshore solar, wind, batteries. We have a new power to X, so hydrogen and e-fuels business. More than 95% of everything we produce is absolutely zero carbon, uh, so we meet that first criterion. It's enshrined in our purpose. Our purpose is to build a world that runs entirely on green energy. We meet the second one. And then the third one is we've signed up uh, as a good citizen to SBTI. Uh, our target is not only to produce clean energy for everybody else to use, but also to use it when we make our own inputs as we have our supply chain. Um, a bit about me, I, I left earlier this year from the US Biden administration. I worked for Secretary John Kerry. I left my dream job uh, to go to another dream job, frankly, because Orsted has been a, an inspirational place to work. Uh, and I lead our strategy, technology, capital allocation, and M&A divisions. Um, Orsted was not always a clean energy company, as you mentioned. Orsted, a, a couple dec decades ago, was the Danish oil and natural gas company. We made you know, oil, natural gas, we had coal power plants, um, and we fundamentally transformed. Just in 2017, we changed our name from the unfortunate Dong Energy to... <laughs> <laughs> My man. Um, to, to, to Orsted. Um, and, and, and we laid out this vision um, of a world entirely powered by green energy. That's the amazing part of the story. Really proud of our transformation. The not so amazing part is that clean energy today is at a crossroads. Many people don't know this. People have generally seen the cost of clean energy fall over the last decade. We in offshore wind, by the way, the cost fell by more than 60% over the last decade. We are the world's largest offshore wind provider. We will invest $10 billion every year for the next seven years in clean, green energy. We're the world's second largest deployer of capital in clean energy, I think. Um, and this is all great, however, Offshore wind in particular, and clean energy broadly, faces a crisis at this moment. Orsted feels it, and as the industry leader and the world's lowest cost producer of uh, offshore wind, I can assure you everybody else is feeling it right now. And so across the world, whether it's in Europe, the epicenter of offshore wind, the United States, which has a nascent offshore wind sector that's just about to take off, now is that crossroads when we make a choice about whether we in fact intend uh, to achieve the renewable energy targets that we want, right? We're gonna do our part to push out that clean green energy so that other companies can meet their targets. Governments increasingly will need to play that important role, not just in the developed, but also the developing world. Because if we don't get through this moment right now, which not enough folks are talking about, we can hit a wall on the green transition. Susanna, uh, Apple is a very impressive company, and I saw, just recently saw your announcement, which made me very happy because I think it relates to what we're talking much. about here. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Um, so well, I'm delighted to, yeah. to be here, um, and I won't take any time introducing Apple because I think no. that <laughs> we're, we're somewhat known. We're However, <laughs> um, I think we were invited here to be part of the transformation group of companies, mm. but I would like to argue that we're really also in this disruptive impact category yes. as well. Um, and perhaps you all know our devices, but know less about our, our climate solutions. And we are very much aligned with mm. the framework that you've presented here, starting with our ambition around climate. Um, in 2020, we announced that we would be carbon neutral for our entire value chain by 2030. So that is not only our own buildings, our retail stores, our data centers that extends into our scope three emissions, our supply chain, and then our products, the entire life cycle of our products. And we followed the science and have done this by committing to a 75% reduction over our 2015 emissions before we apply high quality nature-based solutions to what remains in our footprint in 2030. So a very rigorous and clear approach that's absolutely mm. needed um, by corporations. Um, and to speak to the exciting announcement um, that we made last week, a real manifestation of our ambition, um, Kai used the term, the kick. And I think that within Apple, uh, last week we announced our first carbon neutral products. And I'm showcasing the Apple, the Ultra Watch 2 here. 
Um, but across our Apple Watch lineup, we now have carbon neutral offerings for the first time across Apple Watch Series 9, SE, and Ultra. And that has been a remarkable transformation internally to Apple, um, galvanized a huge amount of momentum for us, and we've been able to take a very rigorous approach on our products in the same way that we look at our, our footprint. So we start by focusing on the areas of highest impact. That's our materials, our electricity, and our mm -hmm. transportation. Mm -hmm. And then we look at what are the highest integrity ways that we can fully reduce those categories as far as possible. And for the watches that we announced last week, we were able to achieve over 75% reductions in the footprints of each of the watches. Um, so just to provide some context for you all, the Apple Watch Series 9 um, has a residual footprint of 8.1 kg of CO2e. That's the same as the production of a plain t-shirt. And so we are able to show that co companies can set these ambitious targets, mm -hmm. that if you apply rigor and focus, that you can decarbonize in a very meaningful way and then bring to market uh, creative solutions mm -hmm. that customers desire, really disrupting mm -hmm. um, and, and driving impact. And in terms of the pillars and comments that Lars and Rune have made, so much of this is based upon scaling. You can't mm -hmm. do this in a way that others can't follow. And so embedded with our 2030 goal, as well as some of those solutions on watch, um, is requirements to have stakeholder collaboration. Um, on our electricity contributions, for example, we are partnering with our entire supply chain to bring renewable electricity um, online. And for the Apple Watch, um, we have, and our entire corporate footprint, uh, we have over 300 suppliers in our supply chain who have committed to using 100% renewable electricity for Apple manufacturing by the end of the decade. Um, that represents mm -hmm. over 90% of our direct mm -hmm. manufacturing spend. And so it's this type of partnership and collaboration, challenging regulations, understanding where advocacy is needed so that it's not only a solution that works for Apple, but that we're bringing online solutions that others can plug into. So we really think that the, the scaling mm -hmm. piece is absolutely critical, not only in our own solution set, but mm -hmm. for others to follow. That's great, and let me connect to that because I think there is here really a big difference in terms of thinking that it's not sufficient to just look at what you're doing as a company, how you're transforming your company and starting to provide solutions. You need to look at the complete value chain and think about what is, it's my assumption, the net zero value chain. How does it look like end to end? And, um, start to collaborate with the leaders upstream and downstream to succeed. Uh, but do you like to elaborate a little bit on that, Lars, and then Varun, that, that it's my assumption it will be required much more radical thinking in terms of the value chain transformation? Yeah. For us, the footprint of 135 kilos, one third is our scope one and two approximately, based on a lot of availability to renewable energy. Uh, in Sweden, northern Sweden, it's mainly hydropower. Mm -hmm. The other two thirds is the upstream scope three, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is actually the uh, the iron ore, <coughs> the scrap, which is pretty low, but it needs to be transported, and all the alloys. So uh, that is a real challenge because the scope one we can work with, and we will start work with that, or we started work with that already to exchange the natural gas that we use. Uh, into biogas and also make sure that all the, uh, the, uh, the coal powder that we use to make steel is actually staying in the steel. But then we need to go back to our value chain and work with, with uh, the miners, <coughs> the transport companies, and, and um, yeah, those, those are pretty, that, that's pretty it, right? Uh, so we need to source it as much as we can locally. Uh, there is a long debate in Sweden on where we are able to source uh, the iron ore, right now we are sourcing it to some extent from, from the Americas, which is not perfect for us, but that will be one part of getting into a, a lower upstream scope three. And then, uh, of course, making sure that we can source also the alloys. And we start already now also to discuss how can we find more energy for the <coughs> coming projects, and also how can we partner with the shipping companies, for example. And how can we make sure that we can uh, dry, uh, transport as much as possible on rail and not on rubber wheels? Mm -hmm. So 
as said, it's unfortunate that we need to uh, import iron ore from, from the Americas. That adds, or that adds to our current foot footprint about 40 kilos. We can live with that now because scaling is more important, but then we need to, to tackle that also. So that is our value chain. But I think also looking at our value web, mm. I just want to say something about yeah. that. Because we have our, our downstream with our customers, they're pretty straightforward. We are working, however, with the premium brands of Europe. So we need to make sure that we get into the long tails where cost matters more than, than CO2 footprint. But we also need to make sure that, and, and we have some uh, debate, me and Johan, about if we are disruptors or are, if we are <laughs> enablers. We can be both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, we, were, we like to see ourselves, maybe it's semantics, but we like to see ourselves as enablers because once we learn something, we want to make sure that spills over to the rest of the steel industry. Uh, we believe that we're going to be good enough to be competitive and we've shown that we, we're charging a premium for our product and stuff like that. But we also make sure that we get rid of the 7% of the man-made emissions that are coming from the steel industry. So we actually need to make sure to share our knowledge. Green Steel is Sweden right now. There are two companies yeah. working with Green Steel. We need to work together. We need to share our knowledge. We need to make sure uh, that uh, the rest of the industry is getting through this transition. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I'll, well, a few things to say. First of all, I hope you guys saw their ad on. <laughs> that was an incredible advertisement. It's like the Super Bowl ad of climate. Um, Mother, Mother Nature. M Mother Nature, um, in, in which you, I think, unveiled that watch. Uh, fantastic ad. Look, it, it is striking to me that we happen to be arranged in the order of the value chain. Um, get this. You actually didn't know this, or maybe you did when you really did your research, but uh, we produce offshore wind in in Taiwan, actually in the Taiwan Strait, it powers TSMC, which is the maker of the semiconductor that is in that chip, uh, in true. that watch. So we're one of those suppliers producing the green energy for that watch. And down the road, uh, we will source our steel in a way that is near zero or carbon neutral. And you may very well be our supplier. So like, this mm -hmm. is, and, and to be clear, we may even power, produce the offshore wind that powers the production of the hydrogen that then produces the steel that we then put in an offshore wind tower to then power TSMC to produce the Apple Watch. I mean, the stuff is very circular. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, by the way, you, you wonder, why is Sweden the epicenter of uh, green steel, of hydrogen production? Um, it's because Sweden is blessed with a near 100% zero carbon grid thanks to its hydro, its good onshore wind resource. We are going to build a major, the world's biggest or Europe's biggest e-methanol facility in Sweden, thanks to the availability of zero carbon energy, and we're gonna put a big electrolyzer there, 70 megawatts, uh, and produce shipping fuel. I wish we could uh, just as easily access zero carbon electricity here in the US, and that's why we're working to quickly decarbonize the American grid. Look, all of this is amazing. The circularity, I could talk about it for a long time, but I wanna come back to the, the downer point I made last time. We're actually in a crisis moment, and the reason for that Fundamentally, the, 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 there's like two major reasons going on. One is the fuel for clean energy solutions, which are capital intensive. You put all the money in up front and you build big infrastructure. And then, for example, you get to churn out green electrons from our offshore wind turbines. You get to churn out green steel. If you don't have cheap capital, you don't have the fuel for clean energy solutions. And right now, the cost of capital has skyrocketed because of interest rate increases around the world. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was like a slow clap or like a sarcastic <laughs> clap. Um, that's, so, a, that's a clap of somebody trying to write a 129.5 uh, Good luck to you. We should get a drink. Um, and the other is we're still uh, enduring the after effects, the hangover from snarled supply chains and inflation. Post-COVID, inflation continues. And as a result, input costs have gone up and the cost of capital has gone up. It means that projects that really penciled two years ago no longer pencil. It means that right now, if we don't step in, a lot of projects are going to pause. We're going to be five, 10 years delayed in the rate of climate progress. Not a lot of people are talking about this. Um, and I'm seeing in the developed world, there are some incentives, strong incentives like the IRA, those incentives haven't quite closed the gap to what we need. But in the developing world, 
There isn't nearly enough gap closing as there needs to be. And that's why you see the preponderance of investment today going to the developed world. And that's a problem. So I'll come back with the question, the call to action question. Yeah. Next. Can I answer it? Exactly. Oh, that's great. The question. <laughs> exactly. And also elaborate on reinventing the value chain. And if you can elaborate also on how you moving towards full circularity over time because okay. of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll bring us up a little bit from the downer yes. that you brought us to, which and, and talk about just the what's needed in the value chain, yeah. um, innovative partnerships, because the problems that you're speaking about are very real, and the, the challenges that we have are severe, and time is of the essence. And so um, when we think about the solutions that need to come to fruition, it's going to take a combination of actors together um, that we really haven't seen before that may have also not been naturally put together. So I'll use an example of aluminum. Um, though there's a very similar story here to steel. Um, uh, if those of you who aren't familiar, there's a project called Elisys, which is about bringing to market um, low carbon aluminum, some of the lowest that's commercialized today. And it, it was a partnership that Apple supported, a joint venture between Rio Tinto, Alcoa, and the government of Quebec. So Rio Tinto and Alcoa traditionally would probably be considered competitors. Um, but particularly for this initiative of bringing to market something, a technology that was nascent at the time, um, the ability to smelt aluminum without direct emissions was something that these different actors across the value chain recognized was absolutely critical for um, deep decarbonization. And so uh, it, this, this material, Elysis, is now commercialized and available. Um, and I think that it is these types of unique combinations of actors, of financing models, um, that, will, that will unlock some of the challenges that we have today. Um, and that's really what is going to be required of the solutions. Um, that actually does also come to the question about Apple's own journey in circula mm -hmm. around okay. circularity and materials. Um, we take a similar approach across um, our, a lot of our materials where we're looking for innovation and technology unlocks because mm -hmm. these problems, um, being able to source high quality recycled or renewable materials um, that can come into our products that we can also then recover at end of life, require mm -hmm. new technologies that never mm -hmm. existed before. Mm -hmm. um, the magnets, even within these watches and many of our other products, are sourced from 100% recycled rare earths. Mm -hmm. And if you asked um, anybody, many people, a few years back if that was possible, we'd probably get laughed at. Um, and now we are shipping at that in our mm -hmm. products. And it's been in great collaboration with our material partners, um, and w even within the regulatory space to figure out mm. how you can move this material around the world mm. um, and be able to demonstrate a circular solution that continues to meet all mm. the performance cosmetic requirements that we've always had. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's re really incredibly interesting if you can create you know, the value web webs of companies in the absolute front line building the next generation value chains and actually showing that they will outcompete the old value chains. So we get a race to the top, basically. The other ones will follow, I think, needs to be the theory of change. Certainly. Yeah. But talking a little bit more about the blockers and enablers, starting with you, Lars. If you just look at what, what is the sort of key inhibitor right now that could be addressed and the key, <coughs> the key enabler mm. to scale faster, these two, one. Yeah one plus and one minus, and what can be done about it? Yeah, I think I would start with the enabler, and I yeah. think that is about feeling the mission and the leadership, the leadership like conveying the mission. Uh, <clears throat> our CEO, he, I, I don't know if he would like me to say that, but he is a little bit almost crazy with our mission. Mm -hmm. to uh, decarbonize hard to abate industries. And I think his strong belief in that vision and also with our founding fathers, actually the two fathers, they are the ones founding Northvolt, also the battery factory. They just say that nothing can stop us. We just have to do this. So we have to fix the permits, the uh, the money, we are raising 6 billion euros now for our first phase in our first mill. Um, so I, I would say leadership and stick true to the mission and share that mission into a fast growing team. Uh, 
Mm. When I was starting a little bit more than two years ago, I was number 17, and now we are 250 people in the company. And in two years, we will be 1,500. Mm. And that brings me into the biggest uh, hurdle, I think. That will be that talent and attracting talent. And by nature, our type of business is not based in California, where everyone wants to live, right? <laughs> um, which is maybe not correct, because living in northern Sweden or living in, in coastal Portugal or living in Brazil could be fantastic. But attracting talent to these places, uh, and northern Sweden is a super uh, non-populated place. Uh, not as many people think there are no polar bears in the streets, but it's not that populated. So attracting talent to northern Sweden, to southern Portugal, that will be the big thing. And then we need to have all the society coming along with, uh, with uh, housing and, and child, children care and health care and logistics and everything. So that is something that will be our biggest hurdle. Okay. But with our crazy mission, I think we're going to overcome that together with the community. That's great. Hold on. Yeah, so, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say because I was intrigued. <laughs> um, uh, blockers and enablers. Let me give you an example. Um, again, I mentioned renewable energy has fallen in cost mm. substantially in the last decade. We all know that story. And governments have tried to get ahead of it. So the government of the UK very intelligently said, okay, uh, the cost of offshore wind, the UK is one of the world's offshore wind leaders. The cost of offshore wind has fallen, fallen, fallen. So for this next round, because every year we try and procure some new offshore wind so we can be energy secure and clean. For this next round, we are going to anticipate that it will fall even further and we're going to just set a hard cap on how much we will pay any new offshore wind farm for their electricity. Unfortunately, they set that cap and then interest rates skyrocketed, supply chains got snarled, inflation happened. And in their most recent auction round, which happened just a few weeks ago, last week, uh, nobody bid, right? This was a disaster for the UK's offshore wind framework because this is their principal route to cheap, green, and reliable energy. Offshore wind, by the way, is the most reliable of the variable renewable energy sources. We, are, we enjoy very steady wind off of the coast. Uh, and, and, and the solution here is not one that's going to bankrupt the country. Look, you can raise that cap on auction prices and still be cheaper than gas, coal, um, any dirty energy source. And the UK can get cheap, clean energy. But there does need to be a recognition of the factors that have just emerged. And I'm confident that the UK government is now on, on its road to, to self-correct. We're getting the right signals. But we need governments around the world to recognize this. And that's, that's going to be the, the enabler. Um, Look, here in the United States, here's another example. Um, the IRA is a seminal law. It's maybe the most important climate change law in history. Um, th there's an incentive for creating the domestic supply chain for offshore wind. And today, it is actually impossible for me to go build an offshore wind steel tower using domestic steel. We just, unfortunately, don't have the facilities tooled in the right way to produce the steel we need of the type to build that offshore tower. We will. Later this decade, in the next 10 years, we will certainly build that quickly. But there's a risk now that we disqualify the projects that need to get built first in this country. And if we do that, the offshore wind market just simply will not take off. So as a result, enablers are, let's get back on track in this crisis period so we can continue the transition. By the way, I think you've got a hand down there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take questions now, but I'd love to hear it. We'll come back on questions. but. Uh... But you have an opportunity this week also to influence uh, you, and I think it's really an important message to the Secretary General uh, who wants to phase out fossil, that in order to phase out fossil, we actually need to enable the scaling of renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a key action as far as I see it. Yeah. Susanna? A similar um, answer as Varun here. Um, I think the, one of the key blockers is the speed and availability of solutions. Um, we know what we need to do. We need to look at materials, we need to look at electricity, we need to look at transportation. And these solutions need to come mm. online quickly. Um, and so with the challenge that we face um, across those three major categories, I think one, the key enabler from our perspective is demand signals. We need corporations and others to talk about how important these uh, materials, solutions, products are 
um, that will deliver the climate yeah. reductions that we need. Um, a good example of where we, we really believe um, this to be working is through things like the First Movers Coalition, mm -hmm. um, where Apple is uh, Apple participates not only in the aluminum sector, but also in the transportation sector, signaling that we need things like sustainable aviation fuel. Um, it's mm -hmm. when people are raising their hands saying, this solution is needed and we are mm -hmm. here for it, um, that I think really does spur on additional um, speed of deployment. Uh, there's certainly challenges to why some of those things have yet to come to market, but we really do believe in demand signals and showing um, coalition willingness on these categories. Yeah, I think the frontline companies definitely can work together actually to accelerate both demand and supply. That's so right. that connects very much yep. to the initial discussion we had here. Uh, I was thinking, Laura, do we have uh, time for a question? Uh, hi, I'm Mr. Minhas, J.P. Morgan. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, so my question is, uh, will these things, uh, green steel uh, and the rest of it, create inflation? Because I was talking to you earlier, and you said that we charge a premium for green steel. I've been reading about electricity prices in Germany and California, and it seems like it's creating inflation when people are having a hard time paying their bills. It's a very, very important question. I'm not sure if I'm the best to answer it, but I'll do my uh, try. Um, we, for sure, we will need a premium because our, our production cost will be a tiny bit higher, mm -hmm. and that is also actually a piece of attracting capital. So, so we need a premium, and thereby I, I assume that we are a part of driving inflation. We will for sure drive inflation locally because uh, in, our, in our construction uh, phase, we will employ so many people. So I would, I would say probably, unfortunately, we are marginally help or driving inflation, but I think there are better people to answer that question. Okay. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you worked in Thanks. Washington. Maybe so, you can help me. Look, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm much more worried about trade barriers that will mm -hmm. cause inflation by raising the cost of, of input steel. So, uh, you know, if, if you give us a choice, we, we will make the economically correct decision and the one that's responsible. We'll, we'll procure uh, economically reasonable green steel. We'll find the right policy support to get green steel that doesn't raise the cost of our energy. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you force on us that all steel is going to increase in price, um, that, that's a real inflation risk. So, um, unfortunately, we don't have any more time. We could stay here much, much longer, but hopefully you have an opportunity to, to, to ask the great panelists after uh, we end here, um, if you stay a little bit. Uh, so just, just a final word, if you would give one or two sentences, the importance of scaling climate solutions and to re well, actually getting a laser focus not only on cutting emissions, but climate solutions. Would you like to say something? I would say partnering, partnering, partnering. We need to partner, and we have all these key stakeholders around our company and in our comp company. We need to make sure that everyone is partnering and helping each other, because this is mm -hmm. so such a complex transition. So partnering. I don't um, I think there has been a lot of attention put on the sorts of climate commitments like, I will go net zero. Very few companies, by the way, with the exception of Apple, are actually capable of doing this. But I think there is not enough attention put on the companies that enable companies to go net zero. That's us. We don't get credit toward SBTI or toward net zero for the power we produce and give to somebody else. That somebody else gets the credit. That's why I love that there is this new climate solutions company framework, because it basically says, Hey, we, Orsted, like 95, 99% of our climate benefit is not what we count on our inventory. It's what we send out into the world and an Apple uses it through TSMC. Getting credit for that will incentivize so many more companies to become climate solution companies because then we get credit too. That's great. Thanks. Um, I think other companies can do what we're doing. And that's the blueprint that we are um, putting out into the world to say this is possible, it is scalable, and there isn't a trade-off between doing right by your bottom line and doing right for your footprint. Um, so our, my, my final word here mm -hmm. is others come with us, <laughs> follow what we're doing, join coalitions, um, embark in new partnerships. Um, this is very doable, especially with helpful mm -hmm. frameworks like what you've provided.
So thanks for that. So the next steps in terms of the framework, that's basically that we will um, de develop this into a proposal or white paper. We will also invite parties for feedback, for fast feedback, and we will road test it 2024. And that is, of course, to influence standards over time, but we need to go ahead of standards. And we will collaborate with different organizations. We will try to avoid fragmentation, but we think this is so incredibly important. So we should drive it in the front line and to, together with you and other leading companies. So big thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for